Good evening. Good evening. On behalf uh, of the director, Susan Weber, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you uh, here tonight, those of you in the room and those of you watching us uh, on BGC TV, either as we stream live or from some point in the future. Tonight we begin our second series of Leon Levy Foundation Lectures in Jewish Material Culture, which is also generously supported by the David Berg Foundation. I'm very pleased uh, and happy to acknowledge the presence in the room of Michelle Tachi. Before I get started, I just want to uh, ask all of you, if you have a phone in your pocket, uh, to turn it off, all beeping devices, and uh, also to refrain from any comments until uh, the end of the evening. Last October, when we began, I introduced the first of these lectures by way of the Hungarian scholar Ludwig Blau, who proposed the study of the Jewish past through its material remains in an essay entitled, and pay attention to the title, Early Christian Archaeology <laughs> from the Jewish Point of View, which was published in 1926 in the Hebrew Union College Annual. It's a strange title, and therein lies, I think, already the history of Jewish material culture as an idea. His point was to show that the study of Jewish material culture, the approach, actually had existed long before, that uh, in fact, it had been invented, so to speak, by Christian scholars at the end of the 16th century in Rome, the antiquarians who studied the early Christian past uh, as it was newly revealed in the catacombs. For them, archaeology, they called it sacred archaeology, was a way of grasping the lives of the early Christians, how they lived, what they ate, what they wore, how they prayed, and of course, how they died. It was, uh, we might say, the history of daily life, the history of family life, undertaken through things. Last fall, in the inaugural series of Leon Levy lectures, Andrea Berlin, the James R. Wiseman Professor of Classical Archaeology, looked at the kind of Jews who existed at the beginning of the Hellenistic period, and then those who were left at the end of it. She introduced us at the beginning to Miliagar of Gadara, a mid-sized city in what was then southern Syria, today northern Jordan, about six miles southeast of the Sea of Galilee. Miliagar first went to school in Gadara, but transferred to finish off his studies in the much larger city of Tyre along the Mediterranean coast in what's now Lebanon. He lived around the year 100 BCE, he sums up all of this life, provincial origin, multiple identities, aspirations, and broad outlook in a pithy four-line lyric that he wrote in Greek. My birthplace was of Syria, the Attic haunt of Gadara. My foster nurse was the island of Tyre, and Eucrates I own for sire, his father. I am Meliagor. Yes, and what if Syrian? Stranger, marvel not. We inhabit a single homeland, the world. In this spring's series of lectures, we don't have to travel so far, neither in space nor in time. We are, as its subjects were, on the land of the Leni Lenape, whose ancestral lives were lived right here. But we are also on the very terrain of today's subjects, the Jews of early New York history. As we learn about their, their not Meliagers, their transnational, hemispherically American lives, Sephardic, Caribbean, United States, New York, and learn about what all these meant to them through their objects, and learn about their objects through their lives, we will have occasion to ask ourselves about all the Meliagers in our rear view mirrors. History for sure is at least as much about the present of the historian as it is about the past being put back together. With the agonies and small pleasures of daily life, social solidarity, income inequality, displacement and immigration in our headlines today, we are reminded just how contemporary, in fact, is Blau's Christian archaeology from a Jewish point of view. Our guide in this effort is Laura Arnold Liebman, 
professor of English and Humanities at Reed College in Portland, Oregon. Her work focuses on religion and the daily lives of women and children in early America and uses everyday objects to help bring their stories back to life. She was trained in Native American oral traditions and culture at UCLA, and her first book was Indian Converts, published in 2008, which explores four generations of Native American men and women and children. Her second book, Messianism, Secrecy, and Mysticism, a new interpretation of early American Jewish life, published in 2012, won National Jewish Book Award, a Jordan Schnitzler Book Award from the Association of Jewish Studies, and was selected as one of Choice's Outstanding academic, academic Titles for 2013. It has been called by no less than Jonathan Sarna the most innovative, ambitious, and important study of early American Jewry to appear in the last 40 years. She is also the editor of Jews in the Americas, 1776-1826, published uh, just now by Routledge, uh, and I call attention to Americas because for her, this means also Curaçao, Barbados, and St. Thomas, as well as New York. She's previously been a visiting scholar at Oxford University, Utrecht University, and the University of Panama. Known for her scholarship in digital humanities, she served as the academic director for the award-winning multimedia public television series, American Passages, a Literary Survey. Her lecture tonight will be followed by a brief response by Ellen Smith, associate professor and director of the Hornstein Jewish Professional Leadership Program and an affiliated faculty member of the Heller School for Social Policy and Management and the Department of Near Eastern and Judaic Studies at Brandeis University. She is also a principal of Museum Smith, where she consults on museum and historic preservation projects around the country and has previously worked as a curator at the American Jewish Historical Society. She's written extensively on the range of American Jewish history, women's history, Yiddish theater, Jewish New Year postcards, portraits of colonial American Jews, and is the co-author and editor with Jonathan Sarna of the Jews of Boston, which was later made into a PBS program. She's now finishing a book project entitled Object Lessons in History, a retelling of Jewish history through things. After her response, Professor Liebman will get the last word uh, and we'll have the opportunity to give a response to the response, after which all of you are invited to the reception outside and to continuing the discussion informally. And so with that, we begin The Art of the Jewish Family, Material Culture in Early New York, Lecture One, Pieces of Silver. Jewish Raina Levy was 17, she married her first cousin Isaac Moses in New York. It was the Jewish social event of the season. The Levies were extraordinarily rich and related to most Jewish families worth knowing in the colonial town. In all likelihood, however, Raina had little say in the matter. At least for the upper classes, most Jewish marriages were still arranged. Silver was key to the ceremony. Since late antiquity, silver has played a key role in creating Jewish spouses. According to the marriage contract Raina's husband signed, silver needed to change hands ritually, marking the couple's change in status, and Raina's change from a virgin maiden to a wife who might bear legitimate heirs. Silver similarly marked the gifts given to the couple. Sometime after the wedding, Raina's material uncle, silversmith Meyer Myers, presented the couple with six plain silver beakers, stamped underneath with Myers' mark and engraved with the couple's initials. Using silver gifts to mark Jewish marriages was not unusual. In various times and places, silver has been given at Jewish weddings. Such gifts often became associated with the union itself. Indeed, the Myers Beakers helped establish the family's identity. Long after the money ritually exchanged was spent or converted into real estate investments, the Beakers lived on in family tradition, 
becoming a key heirloom passed between the generations. Despite the ubiquity of silver among early American Jewish families, Almost nothing has been said about silver significance or for its use for constructing Jewish identity outside of the synagogue. When you leave tonight, I hope you'll remember at least these three things. One, I'd like you to remember something about Raina Moses's life and her family. We know astonishingly little about Jewish women in early America, and Raina's story can serve as an entry point into three thinking early Jewish American women's everyday lives. Second, I'd like you to go home and look at any silver objects you have in your household differently. Silver, I will argue, plays a central role in the Jewish family. This role is related to silver significance in Jewish religion. Third, I'd like you to change how you think about gift giving and heirlooms in Jewish tradition including, if you happen to be Jewish, how you think about any gifts you have given or received over the years. Jewish law requires silver for certain life cycle events, and silver is important as threshold gifts, that is, gifts that mark the time of, or even act as agents of, individual transformation. For early American Jewish merchant families, silver became a useful heirloom, portable yet valuable, the objects reminded descendants of the family legacy they had inherited. Yet that family legacy and the creation of Jewish families themselves are not accidental. Rather, as the title of the lecture series suggests, there's a certain art to the creation of both families and the stories people tell about their families, their family histories. For early American Jews, silver was key to that art. To begin the story of the art of the Jewish family, I'm going to tell you about Raina and her silver beakers. I'll begin by introducing you to the beakers today and explaining why Raina's story is so important. Then I'll wind my way through five cryptic marks, engravings, and scratches left over time on the beakers themselves. First though, let's begin in the present. Where are these beakers? And why is it so important to talk about them? Although the beakers were passed down lovingly for generations, today no one in the family owns any of the six beakers. To be sure, they are well maintained. Two are housed at the Winterthur Museum in Delaware, three are at the Met in New York, and one lies in private hands. Once used to provide sustenance to a family, today the silver beakers at the Met sit behind a lighted display case. No fingerprints or smudges mire their beauty. Their flawless silver is now polished in all its glory. The design is simple. Two purposely incised lines below the cup's lip and a modest ring at the foot showcases the silversmith's talent. Standing only four inches high and weighing slightly over five and a half ounces each, once divorced from their context, they're pretty much similar to numerous plain beakers made in the United States during the final quarter of the 18th century. <laughs> Today, the beakers live in museums not because of Raina or her husband Isaac, but because of their maker, Meyer Myers, the premier Jewish silversmith in early America. When explaining what makes Meyer Myers silver Jewish, Scholars commonly focus on the Jewishness of the silversmith himself or on ritual objects Myers made, such as these beautiful Torah bells. In general, scholarly discussions of Jewish silver tend to focus on ritual silver. Collections of silver Judaica typically include things like spice boxes, Torah shields, Torah pointers, Sabbath lamps, Megillah holders, Torah crowns, and the like. The focus on Jews' ritual use of silver suggests Jews are most Jewish when they interact with God. But this focus on the ritual use of silver in the synagogue has the unfortunate consequence of centering our understanding of silver on men, as women tended to sit in the balconies in colonial synagogues, gazing at silver Judaica 
from a distance. I want to shift that discussion of silver away from maker to owner, from the ritual space of the synagogue to the Jewish home, and from men to women. I also want to put the marriage that inspired the cups back at the center of the discussion. Putting Raina and her marriage at the center is important. We know relatively little about Jewish women in early New York. At, as an important merchant and revolutionary war hero, Raina's husband has inspired a fair amount of prose. His portraits appear in private collections and in the Museum of the City of New York. And his gravestone is highlighted on cemetery tours. His letters with Stephen Girard, one of the wealthiest men in early America, are at the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia, and American Jewish Historical Society here in New York has his personal correspondence, his business papers, and his receipt book, his will, his estate inventory, and many other documents. This means we not only know how Raina's husband, his own view on key moments in his life, but also who shaved him, when, and how much it cost. But when one looks at Raina in the Biographical Dictionary of Early American Jews, one finds only the following. Lovey, Raina, April 15th, 1753 to June 24th, 1824, daughter of Hyman Levy. She was married to Isaac Moses on August 8th, 1770 in New York, and then it, New York City, and that tells you where you could find that information. Fairly underwhelming. Nor is Raina alone. Even the thousand page documentary history of American Jewish women contains less than 60 pages on Jewish women's documents prior to 1800. Despite the rise of women's studies, we know paltry little about early Jewish American women. We do know, however, that between 1750 and 1850, Jewish American women in New York experienced radical changes in their daily lives. Atlantic world Jews had used marriage strategically to create trade networks and maintain religious ties. Married women provided a crucial social glue that connected families across colonial towns. And many men married off their daughters to merchants in other ports in order to assure that they would have trading partners. Thus, while the rise of the Enlightenment had caused Christian marriages already to shift from arranged marriages as a social ideal to partnerships in which individuals were encouraged to marry for love, early Jewish American marriage contracts like Reina's remained deeply tied to economics and social relations throughout the 18th century. Jewish marriages tended to be more conservative because in the Atlantic world, women mattered deeply to kinship and Jewish culture. Yet despite this conservatism, by 1850, Jewish marriages had also changed dramatically. As Jewish immigrants became Americanized, they stopped seeking yoke mates or arranged marriages and sought out soul mates or love matches. Women a generation or two <laughs> after Raina would benefit from these changes and they're the subject of the next two lectures. The women who followed Raina would find marrying for love changed the way the family itself was understood. The shift from arranged to a romantic marriages changed the definition of what constituted the primary kin group. Just as marriage became less about fulfilling one's obligations to blood relations, so too after women married, kinship with blood relations began to carry less weight than kinship to one spouse and his family. And nearly every early 19th century novel you've ever read or any movie you've seen based on one is about this change in kinship. So think of anything by Jane Austen or the Bronte sisters. These novels tend to stage two fears. One, blood relations, usually in the form of inept or dead parents, would it be able to help one choose an effective spouse? Two, the women themselves might choose poorly, selecting a George Wickham instead of a Mr. Darcy. 
Although Jewish women in the early 19th century US didn't write family romance novels, their letters reveal similar anxieties about changes in the family. Objects owned by Jewish women help us understand these changes, particularly heirlooms passed down through family lines. Over the three lectures, we're going to see how women's lives changed between 1750 and 1850. But as our earliest example, Raina helps us understand what life was like at the start of those hundred years. When New York was small, the Jewish community was even smaller, and women, like pieces of silver, were exchanged to cement bonds between male merchants. I'd like to turn now to Raina and how seemingly mundane silver beakers are helpful for understanding not only her life story, but also the art of the Jewish family in 18th and 19th century New York. To support this claim, I'm going to take you through the role silver played in each stage of Raina's life. First her childhood as the daughter of a merchant prince, then her marriage to Isaac Moses, her role as a mother, and then finally her afterlife as an ancestor. If you were to flip over any one of the six beakers, different names and initials are marked, engraved, and scratched underneath them. And I'm going to take you through the beaker's journey in creating family history, mark by mark and scratch by scratch. One mark that all six beakers share is Myers, stamped in cursive into the beaker's base. Although the Biographical Dictionary of Early American Jews identified Raina as the daughter of Hyman Levy, early on it was her mother's family that would make the greatest difference in her life. Before Raina's mother had married Hyman Levy in 1750, slowly had been a Myers. And that extended Myers family surrounded Raina during her earliest years in New York. For Raina, the Myers stamp under the cups bore both testimony, testimony to the cups makers and to her lineage. To be sure, Myers, like most silversmiths, stamped almost all of his work, not just the beakers he made for his niece. Silversmiths were responsible for the quality of the silver used, and for renowned craftsmen like Myers, the stamp attested to that quality and added value to the object. Yet when Raina turned over her six silver cups, the stamp Myers underneath didn't just signal the cups makers. The stamp symbolized Raina's belonging in the larger kin world of the Myers family. When Raina was born in 1753, the Myers were a large school of fish in a very small New York pond. New York was still quite modest in the 1750s. Roughly 13,000 people lived in town, still nestled at Manhattan's lower tip, with farmland spreading out to the north and to the east. New York's Jewish community was even smaller, numbering about 300 people. Up until the 1830s, the wealthiest, largest, and best educated Jewish communities in the Americas were all in the Caribbean, with the largest containing roughly 2,000 Jews. New York didn't become the American center and a center that could rival European communities for supremacy until about 1850. Back in the 1750s, when Raina was born, being a Meyer meant being nestled among kin. Unlike Hyman Levy, who came to New York around 1750 from what is now Germany, Raina's grandparents, Judith and Solomon Myers, had come to New York from Holland in the 1720s. By Raina's birth, the Myers were essential to New York Jewish life. Solomon not only served as a shohet, a ritual slaughterer, for the congregation, he pledged crucial money to build the first New York synagogue. Like most Jews in early New York, the Myers clan nestled around the Mill Street synagogue complex, the hub of Jewish life, with the school, mikveh, and Hazan's house. And on those blocks around the complex lived not only Raina's grandparents in the little blue house, uh, but also her own parents who lived where the red house is placed. In addition, there were four other Meyer siblings in the neighborhood. 
Slowey's brothers were metal workers, and her sisters married key men in the congregation, Michael Moses Hayes, a Dutch Jew born in New York, and Solomon Marache, a Dutch immigrant from Curaçao. Like Hyman Levy, Michael Moses Hayes was a crucial Jewish merchant in early New York. To marry a merchant was a risky prospect for a woman. On the one hand, good winds and fortune could shower the family with riches. Yet the next year, a lost ship or a blockade during a war might bring ruin and bankruptcy. Slowey experienced both. In contrast, her younger sister Rebecca's husband, Solomon Marachi, seemed a safer bet. Marachi, like his Meyer in-laws, was an artisan, most commonly listed as a watchmaker. The one occasion he would engage in trade with Hyman Levy as a partner. Little risk, however, meant little gained. After his wife Rebecca Meyer's early death, Solomon remarried a non-Jew, and the extended Meyer's clan were left to pick up the pieces, making sure Rebecca's unmarried daughter, Judith, could live comfortably. Of all of the Meyer's clan, however, none is so famous today as Slowey's eldest brother, Meyer Meyers, and he's the real reason the beakers are stamped Meyers underneath. He made a very good living because silver was important in early American life. As silver collector Ruth Nutt notes, from the 17th century on, silver was an overt way of saying to your neighbors and guests, I am important. I have money. Silver was and is for display. Beyond its desirability as a beautiful, shiny, and malleable metal, silver indicated people had money to waste. Most of the original 13 colonies had property requirements for men to vote, and in early New York, only real estate fulfilled that requirement. After Jews regained the right to vote in 1747, silver must have been a particularly conspicuous way of showing the family owned more than enough to partake in politics. I have so much money, Silver said, I don't even need to use it to buy real estate. For a luxury item, silver was also interactive. Paintings and rugs just hung or sat there, but silver could be brought out for guests during the tea and coffee ceremonies so central to 18th century American life. Silver was also easily relocated and this transportability was crucial, as early American Jews were particularly mobile. Most New York Jews were displaced during the Revolutionary War and fled to nearby Philadelphia, but disease, work, marriage, and misfortune also meant that almost every early American Jew lived in multiple locations during their lifetime. When Raina had to flee her house in 1776, the silver came along. Although not all Jews bought their silver exclusively from Meyer Myers, Slowey's daughter wasn't the only member of the extended Myers clan to end up with Myers silver. As the 1676, sorry, that was to show you that the use of silver. As the 1676 advertisement for the New York Mercury demonstrates, Meyer Silver was also owned by the mother of Moses Michael Hayes, the husband of Raina's aunt, Rachel Myers. Rachel and Moses Michael Hayes probably also owned those Myers Toro Bells used in Newport and now the source of much controversy. Likewise, the circumcision kit is believed to have been owned by Mo Moses Satius, who was Moses Myers' nephew by marriage as well as a relation through his sister, Slowey. The Meyer stamp underneath Raina's six beakers reminds us of female lines' importance in early New York. Women were the glue connecting family lines. Today, sometimes people will say, I didn't lose a daughter, I gained a son-in-law, but this was literally true for Raina's grandfather. When Hyman Levy came to New York, Thousands of miles separated him from his blood kin. The first step in changing that kinless status was to marry into the Myers clan. The second step, however, was to bring over his own biological kin from the old world and to marry his first child to that relation. 
And with that marriage, I'd like to turn to the second mark on Raina's cup. Just as all six beakers share the stamp Myers, so too are they engraved underneath with three initials, I-M-R. When Raina was 17, she married her first cousin, Isaac Moses. He was 11 years her senior, a fairly typical age gap. The silver beakers were engraved in capital letters underneath to reflect their union. The highest letter, M, engraved directly above the Meyer stamp, signified Raina's new last name, Moses. On either side, forming a triangle were the couple's first initials. To the left, in the most prominent spot, I for Isaac, and to the right, R for Raina. Together, the Myers and IMR formed a sort of arrow. The marks and engravings would become an omen, a prayer of sorts, that the marriage would last and prosper. It did. The marriage was a long time coming. Like Raina's father, Isaac Moses had been born in what is now Germany in a town called Gießen. According to family lore, in 1764, Isaac came to New York seeking business opportunities. Most likely, he was brought over by Raina's father. For Hyman, having a nephew in town, a male child who shared his own bloodline, was essential. Although Hyman and Slowey had 11 children, the first five were girls. Hyman had brothers whose sons he might have called on to make up for this early lack of sons. Even some of those nephews were in the colonies by 1760. Hyman turned instead to his sister Risha's son, showing yet again how female lines mattered in early Jewish New York. Isaac Moses came to the colonies to succeed in business, and he did so spectacularly. Between 1764 and 1775, he developed numerous business skills, working in Levy's lucrative Bayard Street firm and trade, fur trade. During these years, Isaac sold deerskin, bearskins, Indian blankets, spermaceti oil, and logwood to European merchants. He also distributed English woolens, Irish linens, French wines, and West Indian rum in the domestic markets. This earlier advertisement for one of his stores shows the incredible breadth of goods that he carried. By 1768, he had become a naturalized citizen of New York, giving him equal rights to the native born with rights to property, inheritance, and civic responsibilities. Isaac's marriage to his uncle's oldest daughter, Raina, on August 8, 1770, wed him into the Levy family business. Although cousin marriages weren't unheard of among Ashkenazi Jews in what is now Germany, they also weren't really the norm. Business alliances tended to motivate marriage in the old world, particularly among wealthy and socially mobile Ashkenazi Jews. Fathers were responsible for marrying their children into respectable families, and men often exceeded their means in order to provide a good dowry. Although some men made matches for their children while traveling on business, others relied on contacts made through relatives or through a matchmaker. Only poor women, like servants, could choose their own spouses, as there was less to be gained by their alliances. Raina was probably luckier then than her Aunt Risha had been regarding marriage. At least Raina had met her groom. Because German-Jewish marriages were often arranged across space and via proxies, commonly not only the bride, but also her parents, wouldn't have met the groom before the marriage. We don't know how old Risha was when she married, but like Raina, typically women in Jewish women in German lands were close to 20 when they married, with their husbands about five to seven years older. But some girls married as young as 12 and they did so often under duress. The Beakers also represented old world ways. When Raina and Moses' union was etched into silver with IMR, the marks reflected the traditional role silver played in creating Jewish spouses. 
the ceremony was most likely similar to the Jewish American marriage Dr. Benjamin Rush described a few years later. Rather than at the synagogue, as Rish's would have been, the wedding was most likely held in Raina's father's parlor, with special benches brought in for the guests. A beautiful canopy, most likely from silk, would have been hoisted up on poles with the young men wearing gloves. As soon as it was aloft, female relations would have escorted the bride, a veil covering her face. After prayers in Hebrew and sips of wine, Isaac would have placed a ring on Raina's finger. Ever since the custom of rings had been introduced into Jewish tradition in the 7th and 8th centuries, silver rings, along with gold, were favored because they echoed the ancient custom of purchasing a bride, a transaction the Talmud explicitly required be made with silver. Technically, the wedding had already been enacted before the bride and groom even reached the wedding canopy. Men would have arrived early, not only to take part in prayers, but also to witness the reading and signing of a small piece of parchment, the ketubah, or marriage contract. The contract ensured Reina was provided for after Isaac's death, or in, in case she survived him, and protected the bride in case of divorce. Thanks to Congregation Sheriff Israel's excellent record keeping, Isaac, Moses, and Reina Levy's ketubah survives today. Between the Talmudic era and their wedding day in 1770, only a few items had changed in the form of this contract. One that hadn't was the exchange of silver. According to her ketubah, Reina's cousin gave her father, as mandated by Jewish law, the equivalent of 200 silver zizim, an ancient Jewish silver coin. 200 zizim would weigh about 24 ounces in pure silver, or about five of the Meyer Meyer silver beakers. This was the amount required for a pure virgin, whereas a divorcee or widow would only receive a hundred zizim. But because this wedding joined not only a couple, but merchants, Raina's father, Hyman, also provided a dowry of a thousand pounds in silver, gold, jewelry, and household furnishings. Isaac brought to the marriage a groom's gift of a thousand litra monies of the city of New York. Although litra monies is the antiquated way of saying local currency in Aramaic, it also referred to the small silver coins used in antiquity worth 60 shekels. It was unusual during the 18th century for the father and groom to bring equal amounts, let alone such enormous sums to the marriage. Although technically this money was set aside for the bride in case of death or divorce, in reality the money, framed as silver, ensured the couple had funds to start married life, money which in colonial New York was Isaac's to spend. Wedding gifts and the silver exchange in the ketubah epitomize what anthropologists refer to as threshold gifts. Threshold gifts mark the time of, or act as agents of, individual transformation. And they attend times of passage or moments of great change. They're commonly given at life cycle events such as weddings, funerals, and coming of age ceremonies. In Jewish tradition, silver threshold gifts also mark the redemption of the firstborn, a ceremony during which the father redeems his firstborn son with five silver coins. The silver tray and wine glass, typ wine glass typically used at the ceremony echoes the coin silver. As anthropologist Annette Weiner notes, giving threshold gifts marks the transformation of the giver as well as the receiver. On the one hand, some older person, the donor who's leaving a stage of life, disinvests himself of an old identity by, dis by bestowing the same gifts upon the young. Notably in 18th century Jewish marriage contracts, the people actually exchanging goods are the two men. In this instance, Hyman and Isaac. By gifting Isaac with a dowry, Hyman disinvests himself of his old identity as the primary male in charge of maintaining Reina and bestows that identity upon Isaac. 
By returning a gift, the groom's gift, Isaac bestowed upon Hyman Isaac's old role as auxiliary kin. Like the ritualized exchange of silver in the ketubah, the event leading Myers to create the beakers was the couple's union. As such, the beakers are a superb example of the way in which Jewish couples in early America used silver as threshold gifts. Meyer Meyer's silver beakers echoed the ketubah's use of silver to bind new families to old ones. The stamping of the cups of Meyer in the engraving IMR serves to wed not only the silversmith to client, but uncle to niece and uncle to nephew-in-law. By giving silver to the young couple, Meyer Myers was not merely advertising his wares or wishing them well in their new life together. He was also helping transform Isaac Moses into closer kin. Indeed, the wedding marked a newer, closer relationship between the men. Meyer and Isaac would establish ties as fellow Masons, as co-religionists, and leaders of congregation Shareth Israel. Myers would also stand beside Isaac as a witness in April 25th, 1771, when Isaac was naturalized, with Myers testifying to Isaac's residency requirement. When in 1785, the two men helped to form a burial society, Isaac Moses donated a pair of silver candlesticks, but first he paid Meyer Myers 16 shillings to inscribe the silver with Hebrew. The silver candlesticks would be used to mark the transition of the dead from one world to the next. Reina and Isaac were not the only early American Jews to mark thresholds with locally made silver. Families used silver to mark the transition between weekdays and the Sabbath and often willed these objects when they died. Indeed, the prior association of silver with Jewish tradition made the beakers the perfect objects to be transformed into heirlooms, passed down through Reina's and Isaac's descendants. Silver wedded together the generations of the, Meyer, of the Moses clan. At almost every stage in the object's descent through the family, the beakers were remarked with new initials and names. These scratches and inscriptions wove the new owners into a legacy. As the beakers were transformed into heirlooms, they helped maintain memory and Jewish lines. The first scratches also marked Raina's transition from bride to mother. Three of the original six beakers are scratched underneath with the initials SM for Solomon Moses, Raina's second oldest son. And you can sort of see that etching sort of here as clearly. Although not professionally made, the scratched initials are in an elegant cursive. They're marks of pride. The cursive SM loops below the original marks, forming a larger triangle with the past. Born at the cusp of the Revolutionary War, Solomon would inherit his father and grandfather's legacy. Like his father, Solomon would learn to balance mercantile interests with a life tied to the synagogue. In his early years, Solomon worked alongside his father in Isaac Moses and Company, later named Isaac Moses and Sons. But in 1813, he and his younger brother Joshua struck out on their own, often serving as international brokers for the wealthy Stephen Gerard. Solomon's marriage choices reflected both his mercantile and religious interest, but involved a new aspect, love. Like his mother, his wife Rachel was the daughter of a leading Jewish merchant, Michael Gratz, or more famously, Rachel's the younger daughter of Rebecca Gratz, an important Jewish philanthropist and educator. Unlike her mother-in-law, Raina, of whom there are no known portraits, Rachel would be the subject of several Gilbert Stewart and Thomas Sully portraits. Unlike his parents' marriage, however, Solomon found himself needing to woo Rachel herself. As in keeping with the new generation's sudden belief in romantic love, his marriage prospects depended upon more than his future father-in-law's business needs. And fortunately for the young New Yorker, when Solomon visited Philadelphia in 1804, 
Michael Gratz's daughters found Solomon to be, quote, an insufferable bore. <laughs> Strikingly beautiful, the three sisters were known as the Three Graces, a play on their name. The Gratz women were used to, quote, the best society and the wittiest men in Philadelphia. Like so many lovers before him, Solomon seems to have not let either the Gratz's lack of interest or competition stop him. He had already fallen in love with Rachel, who, according to her niece, was the most beautiful sister of all. We have the Gratz's, Gratz women's wonderful letter writing to thank for understanding of their courtship. Although Boris, Solomon was persistent. Upon his return to Philadelphia two years later, Rachel wrote to her sister, Rebecca Gratz, that Solomon had, quote, secured my everlasting friendship. I think him much improved in every respect. <coughs> then only a few days later, Rachel wrote again, saying, Solomon inspired greater agitation than any other gentleman ever occasioned me. Every day he has increased those feelings, and I cannot myself account for this change, but I have learned from my heart to love him. Worried her sister still scorned Solomon, Rachel wrote, you, my beloved sister, shall decide my future. I will give up the man my heart has chosen if you wish it. Fortunately for a story, Rebecca not only provided her blessing, she helped convince their other sister, Sarah, who loathed Solomon most of all, <laughs> to approve. On June 24th, 1806, when Solomon was 31 and Rachel was 23, they wed. Their marriage probably explains why, despite having nine other siblings, Solomon's initials are inscribed on the underside of not one, but three of the original six beakers. Although we might expect the silver to have passed to the oldest son, carrying on the family legacy seems to have better predicted whom Raina and Isaac gave their cups. When Solomon married in 1806, only one of his nine siblings had married, his older sister, Risha. She had married her maternal uncle, Aaron Levy, six years before. And because her parents were first cousins, Aaron was not only Risha's mother's brother, but also her father's first cousin. So not surprisingly, although the marriage lasted a long time, this sort of inbreeding apparently was not helpful for offspring, and the couple never bore any children. Solomon's inheritance reflected a legacy Reina and Isaac wanted to preserve. Heirlooms refer to objects passed down through family lines. And for anthropologists, heirlooms are serious business, wrapped up in gift-giving, inheritance, and identity. Over time, these heirlooms became associated with the family sense of itself, signifying their rank and class as much as heraldic symbols, aristocratic titles, or family trees might. Typically, heirlooms are highly valuable or rare in some way, thereby ensuring the possession, display, and transmission of heirlooms will differentiate the living from their so-called social inferiors and would help reify inherited social distinctions. As archaeologist Katrine Lilios explains, heirlooms serve to objectify memories and histories, acting as mnemonics to remind the living of their link to a distant ancestral past. Giving heirlooms serve as sort of self-curation. The objects allowed family members to preserve ideas about why their family mattered, as well as key aspects of the family sense of self. As they rose into the merchant class, Jews like the Moses family had a palpable need for new heirlooms. Landed gentry and aristocrats could rely on titles, land, or country houses to carry on a sense of family. In contrast, Jews tended to move frequently during this era, and hence sought out small transportable goods to pass on to the next generation. Heirlooms connected future descendants to the past their ancestors had worked so hard to create. For Jews arriving in New York in the 18th and 19th centuries, Heirlooms, particularly silver, became an important way to shape the family and create new visions of the past, present, and future. Whatever real estate Jews had owned in Europe had been left behind. And although Western Sephardic Jews tended to be nostalgic about their aristocratic lineages, 
few Jews had titles or heraldic symbols. For most merchant families, however, the wealth they gained in the Americas could be transformed into heirlooms. Silver heirlooms symbolized the ancestral power Isaac, Moses, and Raina sought to pass along to their children. For men, the power was to be great merchants and moneylenders. For women, the power was to be the crucial solder welding merchant houses together. Indeed, it wasn't until Raina's descendants stopped being merchants that Raina's silver beakers ceased to have a powerful hold over posterity. For Raina's daughters, however, the silver would also hold a power of a new kind, a memento of people to be remembered. And with this in mind, I turn to the second mark related to Raina's role as mother, the scratch to keep for, keep for Sally for her only. Three cups were destined for Solomon and Moses, but a fourth was marked to indicate it should go to Solomon's sister, Sarah, known by the family as Sally. Born in 1787, Sally was the second to last of the 10 Moses children. Like over half of her siblings, she never married. Yet the descent of silver to Sally tells us something crucial about changes in Jewish families during Raina's lifetime and how women's role in maintaining the family legacy had begun to shift. We know fairly little about Sally's upbringing other than her parents intended for her to be a lady. Their father paid for both music lessons and a secular and Hebrew education, though unlike her brothers, she doesn't appear to have attended Sheriff Israel's new co-educational Jewish school. Little as we know, Sally was typical of Jewish girls of her generation in one way. She decided not to marry. To be sure, the new value on romance was probably partially to blame. The pool of acceptable Jewish partners was small for women of Sally's class, and the pool had shrunk further if one felt compelled to follow Jane Austen's advice that, quote, a woman is not to marry a man merely because she is asked or because he is attached to her and can write a tolerable letter. <laughs> the sudden need to do anything rather than marry without affection was further complicated by the disproportionate dearth of available Jewish men. Between 1776 and 1826, intermarriage rates for Jewish men more than doubled. Yet few Jewish women opted to marry out. The result was single Jewish women were as numerous as married ones in the 1790s to 1830s. This wasn't entirely bad news. By remaining single, women maintained greater control over their property. Moreover, larger American culture had begun to rethink the status of unmarried women, who at least some argued, quote, as a class have among them more purity and active goodness. Rather than dismissing single women as old maids, 19th century magazines encourage readers to think of single women as, quote, silent, active doers of good, living in a state of single blessedness. 19th century women also embraced their single status as exemplified by Susan Elizabeth Daggett, whose sewing circle designed her a quilt celebrating her single status when she firmly declared she would never marry. Like their Christian counterparts, Jewish women during this era increasingly embraced not marrying as a virtuous option. They became involved in helping Jewish children and the poor. They helped found not only Jewish Sunday schools, but also orphan asylums. Within families, single women increasingly played a large role in remaking their brothers' wives into kin through exuberant emotional letters. They also tended to help raise their brothers' orphan children when their sister-in-laws died in childbirth. Sally's inheritance of a beaker and substantial amounts of cash reflects single women's new role in maintaining family lines. When Sally's father, Isaac, died in 1818, the bulk of his estate passed to Raina, with whom Sally lived, including their household furniture, silver plate, their house near the synagogue, and their country estate in Greenwich Village, near the house shown here. <laughs> Isaac also ensured Sally had money easily at her disposal to pay for her needs. When Raina died six years later in 1824, Sally, now 36, was left a fortune 
$7,500 to be placed out in stock, with the interest and income going to Sally. Ways of determining the worth of early American money vary dramatically, but at least using economic status, this would be equivalent to inheriting over $6 million today. If Sally married, half would go to her husband, but Raina safeguarded the remainder for Sally's, quote, own separate use and benefit, free from the control and entanglements of her husband. Raina did the same for all of her other daughters. They would also inherit her household furniture, but the rest of her estate, including the silver she still owned, went to her five sons, Moses, Solomon, David, Joshua, and Hyman. Sally's cup accepted. The transfer of silver from Raina to her sons hardly left Sally bereft of silver to use in her remaining years. As an unmarried woman of means, Sally could dispose of her property as she pleased. Her will states Sally's unmarried sister, Rebecca, would inherit all of Sally's money, and after Rebecca's death, it was to pass to Sally's, quote, much beloved nephew, Abraham Rodriguez Brandon. Most of the rest of Sally's will is about family silver, and the lion's share went to Abraham. He received two silver spice boxes, nine silver tablespoons, one silver porringer with cover, spoons marked ARL for family members, two silver rings, two silver goblets, one sugar pot, one milk pot, 11 knives, and 12 forks. Abraham's recent marriage to Ananju didn't deter Sally. In fact, she gave him not one spice box for bringing the Sabbath to a close, but two. Census records and Sally's interest in Abraham suggest she probably helped raise him after his mother Lavinia, Sally's closest sister, died in 1828. Sally wasn't alone in taking on this role. Women in the family without children of their own often raised their siblings orphans. Most of the rest of Sally's silver went to Sally's surviving siblings with instructions on how after their deaths the silver should descend through the family line. Other pieces went to younger relations Sally could guarantee would, quote, value them for the, from their association with previous generations. Yet a little more than a month after Sally's will was read into the record, her beloved nephew, Abraham Rodriguez Brandon, was dead. He was only 33. For the first time since his father's ancestors had left Iberia, a Brandon was buried in a Christian cemetery. He lay nestled among his wife's kin in Trinity Cemetery in Morningside Heights. Everything, including most of the family silver, passed to his young Protestant wife, Miriam, left to raise their two children. Sally Speaker, though, made it back to the Moses family. And the year before Abraham's death, however, he bought a new silver Tiffany Beaker and engraved it as a gift for his newborn daughter, Edith, starting a tradition anew. And, uh, Descendant has told me recently that they still have the cup. Although reunited with Sally's beaker, Solomon Moses' beakers would eventually pass out of Jewish hands by descendants who rejected the family story. Raina was now long dead, and the cups bore witness to her afterlife as the R and IMR. The beaker's last known owner in the Moses family was Raina's great grandson, Lionel Moses Jr. His ownership had begun gloriously. The transfer was marked by a new inscription on one beaker, Lionel Moses from Uncle Isaac, April 16th, 1871. It was the first time a professional silversmith had engraved the vessels since Meyer Myers held them 100 years earlier. The new engraving once again marked a rite of passage, Lionel Jr.'s first birthday. The engraved cup aimed to wed Lionel Jr. into the fabric of family associations he would know only by legend. Uncle Isaac was Solomon's oldest son, who had married, died unmarried and alone 24 years before while working in Mobile, Alabama. When he died, he appears to have owned four of the original six beakers. And upon his death, Isaac's cups would pass to uh, his first cousin, Lionel Sr. It was a solid choice. Tradition was very important for Lionel Sr., whose wife, Selena Satius, was the granddaughter of Gershom Mendes Satius, the synagogue's most beloved rabbi. When he inscribed the cup, Lionel Sr. commemorated his uncle Isaac's part in the family story and thereby explained to Lionel Jr. the tradition he was entering, a merchant's covenant. 
At one year of age, Lionel Jr.'s inheritance was the legacy of silver. It wouldn't be enough. Unlike his fathers and forebears, Lionel Jr. wouldn't become a merchant, but an artist, and a successful one at that. For 44 years, he worked for the famous New York architectural firm, McKim, Mead, and White, from whom he helped design several buildings at Columbia University and the Players Club in New York. Later, he would open his own office in the architect's building and shifted his focus to country houses and residences for New York's elite. Once precious reminders of the family's gifts in commerce, the Beakers had lost their sway. Despite having several Jewish male heirs, Lionel gave three Beakers to his architectural client, Mrs. McFadden, and fortunately, her son donated them to the Met. Eventually, even the inscribed cup also passed out of Moses' hands, selling at auction at Christie's in 2015 for nearly three times the expected estimate. The cups had stopped being heirlooms and were now history. Reina's silver beakers remind us how gifts and heirlooms help establish and maintain a family sense of itself. Silver's presence in the story isn't random. Silver plays a crucial role not only in the Judaica used in Jewish rituals, but also in the symbolic transformation of people from one state to another. Rather than merely seeing silver goods as bright, shiny objects, we should take metals, the metal's role in creating kinship more seriously. When I began, I asked you to remember, or hoped you would remember three things from this lecture, and looking at silver differently was one of them. The second thing I hoped you would change was the way you think about gifts you have given or received. As anyone who's obsessed over just the right gift to give knows, presents given at life cycle events are not just mementos, but also help establish relationships. As those gifts move down through the generations, each person has the right to sign their name to that legacy or reject it. Finally, I asked you to remember something about Reina and her family. The earliest Jewish women in New York often didn't have much choice about whom they married. Rather, their partners were predetermined by the limited pool of available men and family needs. But as the 19th century matured, Jewish women and men started to embrace the dream of romantic love. The dream of a soulmate changed not only whom they would marry, but also kinship, and the Jewish family itself. We began the story with Reina and how her silver dowry solidified a partnership between men. In the next two lectures, we'll see how that vision began to change as the 19th century dawned. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ellen Smith from Brandeis University. Came, whoops, came down today from Boston where we have a lot of snow and floods and very little uh, electricity or heat. So I am working in a very 18th century mode from <laughs> handwriting. I think we'll get through this. I want to offer my very deepest appreciation to the organizers of the Leon Levy Foundation lecture this evening in Jewish material culture. And to Laura Lieben for giving us such a wonderful piece of work on the art of the Jewish family. My job here tonight as a respondent is to talk about pieces of silver. But unlike many academic respondents, I am not going to say but or however. I am going to say and. And I have four ands that I would like to offer to deepen our thinking, both about silver, about early American Jewry, and about what we can and can't learn from objects. Laura's given us a paper on silver, on silver objects, not just as objects and not just as carriers of memory, but as active connectors of Jewish families and trading networks, and as insights into early American Jewish women and their lives. She's done this wonderfully through uh, tracing the 
marks and the engravings, the nicks and the crannies of the silver beakers made by Meyer Myers. So here's my first and. Meyer Myers beakers are, give us a solid longitudinal history of the family of Raina and Moses, uh, Isaac Moses from the beginning of the beakers for at least another 100 years. We can go very far forward just holding one of those cups. Because these cups are so well documented, and Laura's research has added enormously to our knowledge about them, we can also begin to think not, as, not longitudinally, but horizontally about these cups. At each of their stopping points, what did they mean to the people who owned them and used them? And how did they use them? We're able, because of the longitudinal knowledge, to dig deeper into the present moment of those objects at every turn. And we can talk more about that when we go out for snacks later. My second and, and I think, <laughs> based on way too many hours I have spent in my academic lifetime reading Malcolm Stern's uh, First American Jewish Family 600 Genealogies, uh, yeah, well, you should be the curator of the American Jewish Historical sometime. Um, I think that first cousin marriages were actually extremely common in colonial America. And that the first cousin marriages not only reinforce the extensive mercantile connections and wealth, but reinforce it within individual families where life in the colonies, and particularly America, is so precarious. Remember, New York is a nothing in this moment. Whether or not 23 Jews sailed up here in 1654 or not, whoever got here had reached the end of the known world. And the life here for all the status was not very stable. I was also fascinated to learn from Laura's paper that Jews were late to come to love. And I'm anxious to hear in the next two papers how love triumphs over arranged marriages. There's a long and sad history of them in southern <laughs> tip of New York in the first hundred years. My third and is really a very deep appreciation of Laura's exploration of early Jewish women in America, particularly where there's so little documentary evidence about it. We have so much more to learn about early American Jewish women. In regards to objects and Jewish objects, the number of wills and inventories that survive actually give us a very good handle into what objects existed and how women did or didn't relate to them. Laura's tracing at the end of her talk of Sally's control of her cup and the wealth associated with it is a good example of the kind of information you can get from this sort of evidence. Women owned and inherited a lot of stuff in early America. Women owned and inherited a lot of material culture. And we've only just begun to really understand what that connection between women and materiality means for early history. But one thing I suggest, women are not underrepresented in the historical record if we consider material culture. I want to say that again. Women are not underrepresented for historical evidence if we consider material culture. And that will help us to rewrite women's history in profound ways. Um, Tomorrow I'm going to give <laughs> a, t a lunch and learn at noon, or 12.30, is it 12.30? 12.15, somewhere in between. 12.15 here, <laughs> and we'll explore the limits and the possibilities of material culture a little bit more deeply. But I want to put on the table now, based on Laura's talk, how critical that is for us as evidence. And regarding colonial silver, and it, as it's made and, and uh, owned by Jews, and what happens to that history when the experience and the possession of it shifts. So this is my fourth and. It's literally about shape shifting. 
we've talked about silver in the Jewish community, and we've talked about silver primarily in wealthy merchant hands. But what happens when we look at these same pieces of silver from the perspective and the point of view of the maker, or the perspective and the point of view of women, or from the perspective and the point of view of Jews who descend also from people of color. Laura has referenced several times in her talk Moses Michael Hayes. Moses Michael Hayes owned lots of Meyer Meyer silver and potentially the Rimonim. <laughs> Won't go there tonight. Um, <laughs> He also owned a lot of pieces of Paul Revere silver. In my own curatorial trainings at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and American Decorative Arts, I've had my hands all over that silver many, many times. The guy liked his silver. But Moses Michael Hayes and his wife Rachel bring us to a different approach to all of that silver. So I know we've done a lot of genealogy tonight. Hang with me for one more round. Moses Michael Hayes has two brothers-in-law, at least, two important for us tonight. One is Meyer Myers, the maker of the silver. The other is Isaac Turo, someone you may have heard of. Okay, two brothers-in-law, Meyer Myers, Isaac Turo, not a bad way to go. Through both of those families, through the Myers side and the Turo side, there are born two men in those two families people of color. Judah, uh, Isaac Toro, down, uh, not Isaac Toro, I'm sorry, Judah Toro down in New Orleans. That family moves to Richmond where much of Moses Michael Hayes' family relocates. On the Myers side, through Gustav Myers, children of color, they also converge in Richmond where Moses Michael Hayes and Rachel Myers' children bring those, half, those siblings and cousins in and they are acknowledged by the family even though by law they could not be. <coughs> we'll go down nine generations. And now we are to Keith Stokes. Keith Stokes of Newport is a descendant on the Toro side. He is, <laughs> he, well, yeah, he's an interesting man, I adore him. Um, he lives on Vernon Avenue on the house in Newport where the eighth and ninth generation of the Hayes family still lives. Keith is the former executive director of the Newport County Chamber of Commerce, the past chairman of the Turo Synagogue Foundation. Um, he's been on the boards of every historic society in Newport and Newport County. And he is a direct descendant both of the premier Jewish families of early America and of black slaves. He is also the collector and the storyteller of the Hayes family stories. And if you go online and look up Eyes of Glory, you will come to his beautiful website. So how does that shift our understanding of this silver? That this silver has been preserved, protected, and also descended, not just from Jewish merchant families, but the intermingling of Jewish families and families of color. I'd like to suggest, as Laura has tonight, that it asks us to look at silver differently. It asks us to look at objects differently and see what else we can extract. We saw the Mets display. We saw the MFA in Boston's display of the Rimanim. We saw the mortuary, the, uh, <laughs> I forgot the word you used, of all the beakers all lined up. The, yes, thank you. But what happens? What happens when you take the silver we've looked at tonight and put it at other uses of silver that also represent that history? What happens if you put a silver beaker next to silver shackles that enslaved people in the same period, in the same families? What happens in a museum if you put the Rimonim next to the silver and gold mitre of the Catholic Church that persecuted them? which is in fact what has happened in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. We see and think about these materials differently. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so let me finish with my remarks. 
I hope that Laura tonight, I hope that my brief remarks tonight have given you a sense of how far thinking about objects and studying objects can take us. And as Laura has presented tonight, and I'm quoting her, there's a certain art to the creation of both families and the stories that we tell about families. And we have heard her first story tonight, full of art and artistry, and we look forward to her coming talks over the next two weeks. So I know you join me in thanking Laura and the Bard Graduate Center and the Leon Levy Foundation and all of you for giving us the gift of this artistry and coming this evening. Thank you very much. so much on um, I'm gonna just feel like as part of the role of a short person is moving down the microphone and making it lower um, really wonderful comments and I, I want to echo a number of the things that you said back at you um, and maybe add in a little bit more information um, maybe I'm trying to think of what order to put these in but I'll, I'll go through them in the same order maybe starting with the second one Yes, absolutely. Cousin marriages are super important when Jews come to the colonies. And part of what was interesting to me is that's not true among the Ashkenazi Jews in terms of we're coming from Europe. So that, that's something that's really sort of a more invented American tradition. That's not really as much the case with the Sephardic families coming in, that a lot of Sephardic families early on come into the colonies very heavily intermarried within families because of the legacy of the Inquisition. And so you end up having people who come in married to their niece and whatnot, so that that's pretty common to have these close marriages, such that even um, in the early Rhode Island laws, there's an escape clause for the incest clause for Jews, because Jews were seen as coming in with different traditions, which Technically, it's not really true, but so many prominent Jews were married, came to the colonies already amongst the Sephardim, already married to close kin, and continued that tradition. So I think it does have a, a large legacy that's worth sort of thinking about what that does for kinship um, and how long that continues and when that stops. Um, it certainly goes into the 19th century um, and has some negative impacts. There is a Malcolm Stern, bless his heart, indicates um, when people were institutionalized for insanity in his um, history, and that was fairly controversial in his genealogies, but I think it's worth thinking about that, you know, many generations of marrying your aunt, who's also your cousin, is maybe not useful, even though apparently you can do that for a while and it's no problem. Um, so in any case, I, I think that it's an important important part of the story in terms of one of the changes in Jewish marriage. Um, <clears throat> I definitely also want to echo that part of what I've been thinking through with this project is the ways in which material culture answers some of the questions about the lack of texts in the archive that are written by women. So I'm very heavily influenced by um, a woman who works at Rutgers called Maria uh, Marissa Fuentes, who works on Caribbean um, history, and she is very interested in thinking about what silences and the archives tell us as much as what actual items in the archive tell us. So like who deliberately or just because they weren't considered important gets left out of the collections or just weren't literate and hence don't have documents written by them. So I, I really have been trying to think um, both in this piece and the other ones, what does it mean to think about different ways of approaching the questions about evidence um, in terms of the things that people have traditionally turned to um, for telling those stories. Um, but a piece that comes, that I've given before that's part of, I think of part of this sequence really is thinking more about that idea of absence and how do you write histories from absence as opposed to from presence so I would totally echo that I think it's really important um, in terms of the your last point is a really interesting one in terms of 
who do we decide is the person who is important for thinking about different objects. Um, I had been really struck when I was going back and looking at the descriptions of Meyer Meyer Silver that even things that were owned by a couple, everything in the history historiography would be about the men in the family. And so I was really trying to think about what happened if I just turned that around. I think your point about um, who else is in the household is a really important one. It is certainly crucial for the Moses family. Uh, the, the Moses family that Raina marries into owns slaves. We know that. Um, and we know that they also, um, what's called, jobbed out their slaves and would hire them to people in the New York community. And also that two of, this is sort of giving away what's what I'm talking about next week, so if it piques your interest. But we know that two of Raina's, one of her daughters and one of her sons, marries uh, Jews from the Caribbean who were born enslaved um, and had both Jewish and African ancestry. Uh, so it's certainly something that I think of a lot with this family in terms of what does it mean for somebody who owns slaves to then ha welcome people into the family who had begun their lives as slaves? And then also, does that change in terms of how objects are being used? And certainly when you go back and look at the records from this family of who's living in the households at various points, even after slavery, uh, e even after gradual emancipation in New York, there are members of people living in the various Moses households who are um, people of color that are sort of not named, unfortunately. And I don't know if those are people that, like the siblings, came over from Barbados or if there are people um, that are part of the West Indian part of the family, or I don't know if those are people who are servants living in the household, but I think it is important to think about who's touching the various objects that we're looking at, right? Like that, who's putting the, I don't know how many of you have been bothered by having to polish silver, but I hate it, right? You know, so I, I do think like who spends the time of making that silver look good is important. Um, and I can pretty much guarantee it wasn't Raina, right? Like she has a lot of money. She is, she's not the one who's going to be, she's getting it out and serving tea, but she's not she's not polishing it, right? So I think that's a, a really important part of the story. I think I'll end with that, but thank you all very, very much for coming, and thank you to everybody at Bar Graduate Center and to the funders and to Peter for organizing the series. And everyone is welcome now to uh, go outside for a light reception. Thank you. <laughs>